Take your Bibles, if you would, turn to the book of James, chapter number 4. James, chapter number 4. While you're turning, I'm going to ask the Lord bless us. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the privilege to be in a new year. What an honor, realizing that many have not made it into 2022. And God, I ask that you bless us this morning as we preach the book. Lord, I enjoy preaching. It's what you've given me the gift, the calling to do. It's what I live off of doing. I appreciate it. But God, I would not want to preach if their spirit's not going to be here in this place this morning. And so, God, I pray that you'd be here. I pray that your presence would be here. I pray that your power would be here. Accomplish your will, your work in our lives. We'll do our best to give you the praise, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. James chapter number 4. James chapter 4. Be reading in just a moment. The title of the message is perhaps one of the longest titles I've ever given to a message. The title of the message is The Rope of Eternity, The Thread of Now. The Rope of Eternity, The Thread of Now. I realize that doesn't make a lick of sense to you right now, so you hang on and I'll get to it in just a few moments. Well, we did make it. It is 2022. Uh, 22, 2022 doesn't give us any guarantees at all, not a one. We don't know that any of us will be here when it ends or even when it gets well underway. But now that we're here, we do have at least the hope that God's going to give us 365 more days in which to serve Him and to be of some use to Him in His kingdom. The question that needs to be asked and answered, however, is still the same today as it always has been. And that is, what will we do? We've got this year in front of us, brand new year, full of opportunities, hopes, desires, fresh possibilities. What will we do with this year? James offers to us a proposal, God's proposal, a recommendation on how we can go about finding what we should do with this year. This morning, just two thoughts, main thoughts to the message. Thought number one is God's proposal. God's proposal. Look at the first verse of our text, verse number 13. It has the first thought leading us into our proposal. Uh, in that verse, God tells us what the world's plans are for this upcoming year. 413, go ye now, ye that say today or tomorrow. And we will go into such a city and continue their year and buy and sell and get gain. This isn't the proposal, not of God. This is the expectation, the desire of most people in this world. During the upcoming year, what they want to do is make money. Now, making money is not all bad. Having money is not bad. Truth of the matter is, I think you're probably a little bit better off if you've got some than if you've got none. That is, if you've got some and you understand the responsibilities that come with having some. There is no doubt about it that if you do not understand the responsibilities that come with having funds, you may be better off without wealth than to even have it. But there's nothing wrong if you've got wisdom and responsibility with having money. Neither is there anything wrong with working for money. To be honest, the Bible tells us to do that. It's a command from the Scriptures that we ought to work for the things that we have. If there's anything that's destroying our people today, the morality, the sense of duty, the sense of need of our people today, it's probably all the free money that's being given away. No, the Bible says if we're going to have it, we ought to work for it. However, there's something terribly wrong with living for money. We work because we have to work to live, but we ought not live to make money. Most everybody knows that there is a verse somewhere in the Bible that speaks about money being the root of all evil. If you would, let's turn to that Bible verse, 1 Timothy chapter number 6. Don't lose your place here. We're coming back to James chapter 4. But let's understand the warning that Paul gave to Timothy about the danger of loving money. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse number 10. Paul writes, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith 
and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Notice the Bible doesn't condemn money. The Bible doesn't say money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. But that's not, that's not all that it says. In that verse it gives us three dangers that come with living for money. The first one's found on down in the verse. He says, because of this, some have erred from the faith. Loving money, living for money has caused some to swerve away from faith in Jesus Christ. There's many lost people today, they'll never get saved. Because their goal in life is not to find eternal life. Their goal in life is to make the eternal dollar. To somehow become wealthy, to somehow become rich. Not only has it kept lost people lost, it causes saved people to put God second, third, fourth, fiftieth, five hundredth. The truth is... The love of money has caused both saved and lost to err, to swerve from the faith. Not only so, later in that verse he says, it has pierced them through with many sorrows. Not money. Having money is not bad. Working for money is not bad. Loving money. It causes many to be pierced with sorrows. That's what happens when you've got money and not sense enough to know how to handle money. With dollars needs to come sense. I'm not talking about pennies, nickels, and dimes. I'm talking about good common sense and responsibility. If not, you're better off to have none than to have any at all. And then first he listed, it's the love of money that is the root, not of evil, but he uses the word all evil. That means literally most every wrong that you and I can conceive of, it's rooted in people living for money instead of living for other more important things. What are we saying here? We're saying that James warns us what most of the world is planning in this upcoming year. Most of them are just looking at how they can get gain. They're living for the funds God's proposal, first of all, warns us that's not what you want to spend your life for. God's proposal continues in verse number 14. He tells us life's problem. He starts off with man's plan. Now it's life's problem, verse 14. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. He tells us the world's plan, then he tells us life's problem. What's life's problem? Time runs out. Time runs out. In the latter part of that verse, he says, you only have but a little time to start with. And then he says it vanishes away. <laughs> Time's not our friend. Time's our enemy. I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but the truth of the matter is everything about our life centers around time. The date that you arrive on this planet, they give you a birth date. The day that you leave off this planet, they give you a death date. When you pass through a cemetery, you see these two dates on the monuments, and somebody has wisely said our entire life is summed up in that little dash in between the time that we arrived and the time that we departed. Now, if God's good to you, if God's good to you, you'll get to have some grow up days. Some grow up days. Man, grow up days are great days. Uh, the first day that you got your hair cut. Uh, the first words that you said. The first step that you took. Uh, the first step you took to the first grade. Uh, the first date you went on. The first driver's license you got. The first and I hope only time you got engaged and married. The first real job you got. All of these are great first. They're your grow up days. But somewhere along the line, grow up days stop and grow old days start. The first time you got offered a senior citizen's discount. The first time you began to take a lifelong medication. The first time the doctor brought up clogged arteries or knee replacement surgery. The first time you had to walk with a cane or a walker or in a wheelchair. The first time you heard your family whispering behind you, nursing home. And the first day they started talking about calling hospice in. Hey, if you live long enough, the grow up days stop and the grow old days start. And you know what's sad? 
you're usually not even aware of when you step across that line. Just somewhere along the scope of time, time vanishes away. It's but a little, and it vanishes away. In the first part of verse number 14, James compares our entire life to a vapor. Steam rising up a few inches off of a boiling pot of water, a vapor. You know what a vapor is good for? Nothing. It, its existence is too short. Its strength is too weak to influence or change anything. It's there and then it's gone. What James is saying is your life and my life is like that vapor. It's too short to change anything. It's too weak to influence the rope of eternity. You say, oh, preacher, there's that term again. Rope of eternity. What is the rope of eternity? Well, for a moment, if you would, imagine a rope. A rope that we'll say starts at the center of our solar system, the sun. And then it expands, it goes in one direction until it reaches the end of our solar system. To be absolutely honest, I'm not sure what planet they're calling the end of our solar system now. Sometimes it's Pluto, sometimes it's not. But uh, wherever they, they, they say it ends at, just imagine, if you would, a rope that starts at the sun and goes to the very last planet in our solar system. That, that rope would have to be millions of miles long. Now for a moment, just imagine that rope is eternity. Now, you and I know eternity doesn't have a beginning and it doesn't have an end. So, if that rope were really going to represent eternity, it doesn't start at the center of our solar system. It starts in infinity past and it wouldn't stop at the last planet. It would go on for infinity. But just, just so that we can try to comprehend eternity, we'll shrink it down. We'll say it starts at our sun and it ends at the last planet in our solar system. We'll call that the rope of eternity. I don't know how big something like that would have to be. Big as a house? Oh, no, no, no. It had to probably be as big as a planet. The diameter, maybe as big as thick, maybe, maybe bigger. It, it might have to be the diameter of our sun uh, to stretch millions and millions of miles and not to fall apart. It had to be a humongous rope, but that's the rope we'll call eternity. Now, if you would, imagine laid across that rope a thread. A thread like some of you ladies might would use if you're sewing up a tear, a dress, or maybe cross-stitching. Just a little old piece of thread. And, and that thread is laid across that humongous rope of eternity. We'll call that the thread of now. The thread of right now. I'm not talking about the thread of your life or the thread of my life. Mm -hmm. That thread would be way too big on the rope of eternity for the thread of your life or the thread of my life. I'm talking about it's the thread of right now of all of this created time period. The Bible tells us that creation itself started back in Genesis 1 when God first said, let it be. And the Bible indicates that creation will stop in what Paul wrote, 1 Corinthians 15, 24, once Jesus has redeemed and restored and renovated the world, and then he gives it back unto the Father. So creation starts, Genesis 1, it ends sometime after the millennial, it ends sometime after the final judgment, it ends sometime when Christ has taken everything that was made, renews it, and then gives it all back. We'll call that creation. That's the thread of now. Man, that thread's pretty thin. But that thread sums up at least 6,000 years of history so far. At least. That's what, that's what Bible theologians think the time of creation is. Of course, if you're an evolutionist, that credit the creation takes up four or five million years, or billion years. I mean, billions and billions. But whatever you think now is, that thread covers that. The width of that small little thread laying on that rope of eternity, it sums up right now. That would include the lives of billions and billions of people, all represented by that little old thread. 
That would include the days, the life hours of every human being that has ever lived and ever would live. If we wanted to find my place on the thread of now, we'd have to have a super powerful microscope. I mean, we'd have to have a microscope that, that looks beyond the threads of the threads. We'd have to have a microscope that could probably look at the atoms to, 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 to figure out the place of Carl Hall in creation. What, what mark has Carl Hall, or you, what mark, what influence has Carl Hall made in the time of now, the threat of now? Man, we'd have to have a super microscope. We'd have, to, we'd have to be looking at atoms and electrons and protons. Could I just tell you what my effect in creation has been? Zero. Matter of fact, the effect of all of creation on the rope of eternity is also zero. When you lay that little thread down on the rope of eternity, it doesn't cause one vibration at all. You pick that thread up off of the rope of eternity, it doesn't lighten the rope in any detectable way at all. To be absolutely honest, the thread of what's going on right now has zero impact on the rope of eternity. Now, wait a minute. If all of now has no impact on eternity, what does my life and your life have an influence on eternity? James tells us it's like a vapor coming off of a boiling pot. Its existence is too short. Its strength is too small. Our existence doesn't alter eternity at all. It really doesn't matter how famous you get. It really doesn't matter how infamous you are. In the scope of eternity, I know I'm making this sound bad, but in the scope of eternity, you and I have no significance at all. Now, I want you to get what he's saying. First of all, he tells us God's plan. Excuse me, man's plan. What's man's plan this upcoming year? They want to make money. Then he tells us life's problem. Life's problem is we're not going to be here very long. We're not going to change things at all. In the rope of eternity, even the thread of time doesn't cause a single vibration, doesn't add anything doesn't remove anything. If I were to lay the thread of now right down on the rope of eternity, this big thread so wide in diameter, maybe as big as a planet, do you think you'd even be able to see the thread? No, you wouldn't. Uh, you'd be so enamored with the, the length of it running off in infinity that way and the length of it running off in infinity that way, and it'd be so big. Even if you were standing beside it, you wouldn't even notice it. Mm, the problem with time is it runs out quickly. Would you notice God's proposal? What man plans, verse 13. Man's problem. Time's running out, verse number 14. Verse number 15. God's counsel. Now, having expressed that to us, James tells us what we need to do to find out how to spend this year. Look at verse number 15. For that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. Here's James' counsel. You, realizing that your life is so short, like a vapor, here and then gone, no influence on eternity, you ought not do anything apart from the will of God. You ought not make any plans without consulting the will of God. It's interesting. He states it very meekly. As a matter of fact, he really understates it. He just simply says, don't do anything without seeking the will of God. Now, let me say this one more time. What effect do I have on eternity? None. What effect does the threat of now have on eternity? Absolutely zero. But what I do with my life will affect at least one person's 
eternity. One person will be affected by my life. And if I'm very, very blessed, I might actually have an influence on a few other people's lives. It won't change the rope of eternity. It won't change the thread of now. Absolutely nothing I do is going to change the thread of now. Nothing's going to cause any pressure to be added to God's eternity. Nothing's going to change the load. But what I do with my life will definitely affect the eternity of one person. And it might affect the eternity of a few other people. What's his counsel? Don't you do anything without getting the will of God. Consulting the will of God. Number one, what's God's proposal? God's proposal is you're not going to amount to much. Not in eternity. If you want to amount to anything at all, you better get it from God. Point number two. Just two points to the message. God's proposal, number two, God's counsel. Having understood now the brevity of life, that there is no strength to it, that there is no longevity to it, that the existence of every human being is just a vapor, God does offer some counsel that might help change where you will spend eternity. Might I give you God's counsel? Just two points under that. Number one, you must be born again. John chapter 3, verse number 7. Nothing I do is going to change God's eternity. And let me tell you, it's like a rope as big as the sun stretching from one end of the galaxy infinitely another. Nothing I do will alter eternity. Oh, but one thing that I can do will alter my eternity. I can be born again. Uh, every time I read John chapter 3 verse number 7, the last five words of that verse, ye must be born again. That's the way Jesus stated that phrase, ye must be born again. He doesn't say you ought to be born again. He doesn't say it would be wise for you to be born again. He says you must be born again. And I ask myself, why did he say that? Because if you want eternal life, you must be born again. I, I realize when I'm preaching, I'm not preaching to newbies. Most every person that's in this sanctuary today, I think every person that's in here has been here at least once before. Most of you many times before. Uh, it's being recorded on video. It's being recorded for audio. It'll go on the Facebook pages. It'll go on the web pages. Other people will probably see, probably hear, most everyone them will have heard me preach many times before. We don't have new people show up at our web pages. You've all heard it before, but let me tell you one more time. You must be born again. What does it take to be saved? It takes two things. Number one, it takes believing that Jesus Christ is God's Son. I say the same thing over and over again. You can be the best moral person that this world has ever seen. You can go to church until you have Sunday school ribbons hanging off your lapel. You can be bab baptized in the baptistry until your skin is wrinkled and pruned up. None of that matters if you've not accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you have not believed that Jesus is the Son of God, came to this world, lived a sinless life, died on the cross for sinners, was buried in the grave to take away our sins, and rose on the third day to give us eternal life. There's a lot of things you can believe. You can believe IRS is going to come after you if you cheat on your taxes. You can believe the cop's going to give you a ticket if you run the stop sign. You can believe that you'll earn a great reward, reward program if you stay at your company for 40 years. You can believe a lot of things, but will nothing change you like believing what the Bible says about Jesus Christ. If you want to go to heaven when you die, you must believe. But here's where I get some folks who disagree with me a little bit. I'm going to tell you this again. You can believe that Jesus is who He said He was, and you can still die and go to hell. Bible tells us that even the demons believe, and they even go a step further. They tremble at the name of Jesus Christ. They're not going to heaven. They're not going to heaven because it takes more to go to heaven than just believe. There's two things that are required. You must believe, but second, you must repent. Believe and repent. That means surrender yourself the best you know how to Jesus Christ. You can't get over believing in Jesus Christ. If you believe on Jesus Christ, it'll change your life. Let me tell you, you can't get over repenting of your sins. You can't. 
If you actually repent of your sins, it will change you forever. I get tired of people telling me I have been saved. I believed and I repented, but that I'm living like the devil every day the rest of my life. Something's wrong with a salvation of that magnitude. I would say it's no salvation at all. God's counsel. He's telling us your life is short. This past week we had funerals of two people who were in their 80s. Man, 80 is a long, long time. No, 80 is just a flick in the bucket. Uh, I mean, uh, yes, just yesterday you were taking your first step, getting your first haircut, saying your first words. Just yesterday you remember going to school. Just, just yesterday you remember getting that first drive. Just yesterday you, you, you proposed and, and, and got engaged and got married. Just yesterday. But somewhere along the line the grow-ups stopped and the grow-olds start. And your life is like a little vapor. When you were a kid, you looked at the folks that were old, wrinkled like prunes, and you thought, man, they don't want to do anything. They're just old, dried up. Got left. No, friend, I want you to know inside that old war body is a spirit that still thinks in his mind he can leap over trees, that he can still climb and, and work and do. A ladies who still think that they're able to do things that they haven't been able to do in many, many years. It, it's, it's just the way it is. Life is like a vapor. It's here today and it's gone tomorrow. If you want to change anyone's eternity, you better change yours. You must be born again. God's proposal, God's counsel is that you don't do anything without making sure that what you're doing is the will of God. Second counsel that God gives. First is you must be born again. Second counsel is found over in the book of Colossians chapter 3. You don't have to turn there. It's just one verse. Just listen. Colossians 3, 2 says, Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Now, this is God's counsel. All right, it's not in the book of James. No, it's not there. Neither was you must be born again. Had to go to John for that. You got to go to Colossians for this. But I, I honestly believe that if you want to make your eternity count, these are the first two counsels of God you need to hear. And these are the first two counsels from God you need to obey. Number one, you got to be born again. Everything starts at the foot of the cross. If you don't start there, you got nothing. You must be born again. But then, even after you're born again, if you want your eternity to really be different, you must take your eyes off of this world, quit living for the riches of this planet, and set your affections, your desires on the things above. I checked. As of Wikipedia last night, the two richest people on the planet, Jeff Bezos, Elon, Elon, not sure how you say his name, Elon, Elon Musk. Musk. Two richest men on the planet. I don't know how rich they are. I could have looked it up. I could have figured up the totals of their net worth. But one thing I'm pretty sure of, if you were to take the totals of those two men, the wealth that they have, they probably have more money than 35, 45% of the nations of the world. Those two men alone could probably buy and operate half of the nations of the world. Maybe not all at once. They might have to do it in steps. But they could probably buy and literally operate, be czars and financially successfully operate as much as 35 to 45 percent of the nations of the world. Most, many people on this world would consider them to be their heroes. To be as wealthy as people like this. Let me just tell you. Three seconds after you drop off into eternity, you will realize their names meant nothing on this planet at all. Now, don't get me wrong. Right now, they're influencing things. Man, they're the callers. Uh, they may be the ones who will determine this year whether we'll have groceries on the shelves or not. They may be the ones who determine whether there'll be cars on the car lot. These men may determine things right now. But I'm telling you, the entire thread of now has no impact on the rope of eternity at all. People aspire to be powerful. It's almost, it's almost a joke to say, but it's true. One of the most powerful men in the world right now is our president. On a good day when he's capable, our president, Joe Biden, and, and on other days, whoever his handlers are, our most powerful man on this planet. 
He signed a couple of weeks ago a mandate, an executive order. Has no power in the constitutional courts, in my opinion. However, that mandate to be vaccinated will influence, it's estimated, one-fourth of the population of America. One-fourth, they say, of Americans have not yet got their, 100 million Americans have not yet gotten their vaccine. And because they haven't, that mandate will force them to lose their job. So directly, one, one, one stroke of a pen, this powerful man could put one-fourth of the American population out of work. I got news for you. He won't just affect with that one edict, one-fourth, but because one-fourth of the workforce of America will also be out of work, he will affect every American in this country. Man, what power! The stroke of a pen put a fourth of the American population out of work, put all of the American nation in dire straits. And yet, for all the power this man has amassed, for all the power that all 46 presidents total together, added together have, they will not cause one vibration on the rope of eternity. No. Uh, all of their edicts, all of their orders, all their influence, all their power, all of it added together won't cause one spring on the thread of now when it's pulled up. Won't cause one extra weight, one molecule of weight to be added to the rope of eternity. Won't infect it at all. Has no bearing at all. The name Elvis. Man's been dead 45 years. He was a sharecropper's son from Memphis. And yet, there's probably not been a man, an entertainer, who has been more copied, more imitated, and whose name is known by the first name alone around the world as much as Elvis Presley's name is. And yet, for all the glory that Elvis accumulated for himself, his glory will not put one shadow on the rope of eternity. I mean, he's, he's popular. 45 years after his death, his name is still uttered. He's still imitated. All of his glory, all of it, won't cast one shadow on the rope of eternity. All of these things, the money you can make, the power you can amass, the glory for yourself that you can accumulate, won't alter the rope of eternity. But if you will set your affections on things above, you can change your eternity. If you'll accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can have you a home in God's heaven for all eternity. If you will surrender your will to God, you will hear from the lips of the Savior the praise, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And if you will serve this omnipotent God, you will earn for yourself rewards and positions that you will get to earn for all eternity. What am I saying? You ought not do anything with the life that God has given you without first consulting the will of God, without getting the counsel of God. What's the counsel of God? Ye must be born again. Set your affections on things above. I'm going to tell you, if you could really, if I could really understand what James is saying when he says, our life is a vapor, that it literally in the scope of eternity amounts to nothing. That all of now, all of now, from the first let it be until the last, give it back to God, all of it really affects eternity in no way, in no shape, in no form. Then I think we might would understand how foolish it is for us to live a life trying to amass wealth, trying to gain power, trying to attain some level of glory or fame on this planet. No, 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 no. Don't enter 2022 that way. Seek God's will. I'm going to close with a dangerous story. 
It's a dangerous story. It's the kind of story I don't often give. It's actually, I think, got a lot of truth in it. It's based on Bible truth. But at some point, I'll quit telling you what the Bible says, and I'll start telling you what might be possible. That makes for dangerous preaching. Anytime we start speculating on things, that makes for dangerous preaching. But I got to thinking and reading the Bible about what opportunities salvation, surrender, and service to God might have on the rope of eternity. On the rope of eternity. You realize, as I said earlier, that the rope of eternity doesn't start with our sun. It doesn't end at the end of our solar system. It goes on infinitely in the past, and it goes on infinitely in the future. There's only one, there's only one that runs the full span of the rope of eternity. Only one. No thing, as far as we know, no thing and only one that runs the entire span of the rope of, of eternity. That's God. God has always been. God will always be. Now, you have become eternal beings. I have become eternal beings. We will never die. We will live forever. We will exist forever. But we didn't exist forever. We had a point of beginning, a point of origin. We're not like God. God has always been God will always be. He's the only one. That means everything that is and ever will be will have to be created by the hand of the one who is the eternal one. We know that there's a heaven. We know it because our Bible tells us there's a heaven. As far as we know, heaven's not eternal. There was a point along the rope of eternity where God said, let there be a heaven, a place for me to abide. And it was so. We know, we've got a Bible, it tells us these things are true. These are biblical truths. We know there's a being called angels. We know they exist. They're not eternal. Which means there had to be a day when God said, let there be angels. And there was angels. We know that there are beings called cherubims. I think the plural is actually still cherubim, but I usually say it with an S on the end, cherubims. Uh, as far as we know, as far as we know, they, they may just be an evolved, no, they may be a, a highly advanced being of an angel. But Brother Trotter pointed it out to me, and I think he's probably right. The Bible never calls cherubims angels. It calls them cherubims, which may mean that cherubims are beings that God created somewhere in the past that aren't angels at all. That they are uniquely created beings. We know, according to the book of Revelation, that there's at least four beasts that stand by the throne of God. Don't know that there's five, but we know that there's four. The, as far as we know, like the angels, like the cherubim, like heaven, they're not eternal. At some point, God created those four. The book of Revelation talks about four and twenty elders that sits around. Some people believe those are symbolic of the church. And if that's the case, they don't really exist. But if they really do exist, if there's four and twenty elders, they're not eternal. There came a day when God had to say, let there be four and twenty elders. What I'm saying is there's only one that runs the full scope of the rope of eternity. That's God himself. Everything else had to be created. We know also, we know this because the Bible alludes to it, that the human project was not God's first project of creation. As I said, he created angels, and the Bible gives us enough details to know that the angels have a story, just like the humans have a story. We know, for example, that the angels were created much like the humans. When God first created them, they were sinless, they were pure, and they had a free will, just like God created the human race. And we know that with the free will, God gave the angels a choice. We know this. The Bible indicates to us that God created them all, even Lucifer, pure, sinless, and with a free will. And he gave to them a choice. They could follow God or they could follow sin. They could choose for themselves to be with God forever in heaven or they could choose to be damned. They could choose to be sinless beings or they could choose to be lost and separate. And we know because the Bible tells us some chose God 
and some chose sin. It's amazing, really, you stop to think about it. Now, we don't know all the details. We can't know what the Bible doesn't tell us, but these things we know to be true. I, I'll call it the angelic project. There was, a, there was a, a story of the angels before there was the story of the humans. Somewhere along the rope of eternity, God created them pure, without sin, gave them a choice. Some chose God, some chose sin. Now I begin to speculate. This is where it gets dangerous. Don't know this. The Bible doesn't tell us this. But I wonder if it's possible that some of the angels, this is wondering, this is dangerous. This is not Bible. This is me wondering. I wonder if it's possible that some of the angels chose to serve God more than some of the other angels. And I wonder if some of the demons chose to turn away from God more than some of the other demons. You see, there's actually ranks of angels. Now, it may be that God created the angels with ranks. It's possible. Matter of fact, I'd say it's probable. It's probable. We know at least two angels by name. As far as I know in the whole Bible, we don't know but two angels' names. We know Gabriel and Michael by name. And they're not called angels. They're called archangels. Archangels. And we know that there's some demons that were so bad, Jude tells us they've been locked up in chains of darkness into the day of judgment. I wonder, I just, this, is, this is wondering, I don't know, but I'm wondering. He gave them free will. They could choose him, they could choose sin. Some chose him, some chose sin. I wonder if their will allowed them to decide just how diligently the angels would serve. And I wonder if free will allowed the demons to decide just how far they would go. I don't know that. I don't know that. I'm just putting that out. I'm telling I know there was an angelic project. I know that they chose some things. But here's what I'm wondering. Is it possible that some of those angels who chose to give themselves wholly to God, if they did, is it possible that God let those angels, like Micah and Gabriel, and many others that He's used on this planet, is it possible that He actually used them in the second project, the human project? Is it possible that somebody could choose to serve God now in the human project? with such ferocity, with such dedication, that, that God might use them in another project on down the rope of eternity. There's been two projects. There's been what God did with the angels. There's been what God's done with the humans. I don't know that there'll be a third project. But I do know eternity's a long, long time. Eternity's a long, long time. And I can't imagine... That all we're going to do is sit on clouds with harps and wings and strum our harps for. No, I got a feeling there's things the creative God is going to. Is it possible that we could serve God right now, today, in such a way that God might actually use us further down the line on the rope of eternity? I'll promise you this, if your goal in 2022 is to see how much wealth you can get, He won't be using you. If your goal is to see if you can be the next Bill Gates, the next Joe Biden, who in the heaven would want to be that? The next Elvis. If that's your goal, you won't be the ones that God will use on down the line on the rope of I'm going to say this, he's not going to use me. No, it's going to have to be a better caliber than I am. But I'm just saying, it's possible, it's possible that if we follow God's counsel, you must be born again, set your affections on the things above. It's possible that God might find a place to use us in his service for all eternity. If such reward is possible, that's the one I'd like to work for. 
what will you do with your 2022? The rope of eternity, the thread of now. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to preach. Lord, I pray we not create false doctrine. I don't want to. I don't want others to. But God, I can't help but to imagine what you might have in store for forever. What opportunities may be given to those who will surrender for service today. Lord, help us to find out firsthand. Move in this place this morning. We can't change eternity. But God, we can be used in the future.